Hey everyone, welcome back. Yep, and we are back too. <laughs> um, <laughs> we are back with our next session. Um, this is also going to be an interesting one. Um, it's something I'm personally invested in actually. It's WebAssembly um, being presented by uh, Rishi Abilek. Um, which normally is really interesting because WebAssembly is something that's taking a lot of, uh, it's, it's catching all of our attentions. A lot of big players are getting into it. So it's fun to see that um, people are bringing this, bringing this into um, DaveCon. Let's, let's just go ahead and bring Rishi in and let him talk okay. a bit more about it. Yeah. Hey Rishi, welcome. Hey Rishi, Hello guys, how are you? How feeling? Are you? Yeah. I'm yeah, great, I'm good. great. <laughs> Having a good day? Okay. You've been to the previous sessions? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been to the previous session. I'm missing, yeah. I'm missing uh, DevCon, the real <laughs> one, where we actually meet people, go in the rooms, and get all yeah. the goodies. Yeah, that it's was true. a good time. We well, all we hope, yeah, we hope we see you next year. I yeah, mean, definitely, definitely. It's, good, definitely. it's not gone, it's not gone. It's just put on pause while, you know, while the world is updating right now. So it's, <laughs> it's going to be bad. <laughs> Um, okay, well, Rishi, yeah. so, uh, why don't you just tell us a bit about yourself and uh, what you're going to talk about before we move on to the session? Well, uh, um, so I'm uh, Rishi Abilek. I've been uh, in technology. I've been working in the IT field for nearly a decade now. Uh, I'm a senior software engineer. I've worked with a lot of technology. So today we'll be looking at WebAssembly, which is the new hype, which is uh, catching on. Uh, many people are talking about it, and some people have used it. They know exactly what it is. Some people think they know what it is, and some people have a vague idea what it is. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to uh, present to you guys what WebAssembly is, how it started, why we got there, and how we're using it uh, in real life. So I'm sure you're going to yeah. love this session. If you love, if you love front end, you love technology, you're going to love this session. Yeah, uh, awesome. I'm one of the thinkers. Actually, I'm one of uh, I'm one of the ones that think I know what the WebAssembly is. But deep down, <laughs> I know I don't know. I don't know it all. So I know <laughs> I just have an idea of it. But um, you know, we need always need to invest more. So that's why this is going to be a great session. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, if 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 I can ask a question right now, I mean, uh, normally we would have the audience, but. Uh, do you think WebAssembly is a programming language? I think many people ask this question. Is WebAssembly a programming <laughs> language? <laughs> so I, we'll see about it. I, I, yeah, I'm I, not I, even going to try to answer this. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not going to give my answer either. Let's see. Let's let, let the session answer it. What do you think? True. Exactly. <laughs> right. So those of you guys who are watching, well, think about it. Is WebAssembly a programming language? I'll answer the question in a few minutes. Okay, All right. we're going to leave the floor to you then. Um, have a good viewers, one. Don't forget Thank to you. leave your questions in the live chat and leave some comments, give some support. All right, let's go. So, hello, everybody. Today, I'll be talking about WebAssembly, which is, for me, I believe, is the game changer. Um, so the topics we'll go through in this session, uh, I'll tell you what WebAssembly is not. What the purpose of assembly is, uh, what it is, how we got there, because there was a need for it, and that's why we got WebAssembly. We'll go through some real-world example, and finally, I'll finish with a tiny demo, because we love demo in these, dev, in these dev cons. So who am I? I'm Rishi Abilek. I'm a senior software engineer, as I mentioned before. If you want to look, uh, look me up, uh, that's my Twitter and LinkedIn handle. So WebAssembly is -na 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 -na, not a programming language. For those of you guys who think it was, it's not. WebAssembly is often associated so much with C++ that a lot of you guys think that it's all about C++. When in fact, WebAssembly is more than that. It's true that many of you guys who looked for WebAssembly on the web, you, f you found demos running on C++ and EM scripting. But that makes sense because EM scripting and C++ are amazing tools that allow you to build, uh, to, to export your, to, uh, your program into WebAssembly and bring it to the web. But what is important for web developers is to realize that 
it is not just C++ and that WebAssembly itself is a really useful tool to have in your pocket. Now, for the front end developers, you'll be thinking, is WebAssembly the end of JavaScript? No, WebAssembly doesn't mean it's the end of JavaScript. Actually, those two work hand in hand together and we'll see about that. So, as you might be asking, what is the purpose of WebAssembly? So, WebAssembly is trying to address the fundamental limitation of the web. I say that again, the fundamental limitation of the web. To understand what these fundamental limitations of the web, uh, let's look at what web technologies consist of. So, in 1993, the first version of HTML was introduced. And then, within three years, we had CSS, followed by ECMAScript, also known as JavaScript. Uh, the version one was released in 1997. So we had structure, we had style, and we had logic. We used all these three to build amazing uh, website. But if you look at the technology space, we haven't had anything new since then. As far as the fundamental open space for the standard World Wide Web, we stopped there. So. Did we stop because we found everything we needed or did we stop because we found another technology stack or were we not done yet? As a developer, when I think about programming language, I, think, I tend to think about them on a spectrum from high level to low level. And at the lowest level, there's machine code, the actual instruction for the physical CPU inside the computer. Moving a bit higher from the machine code, there are languages like C, C++, Rust. These languages are compiled to machine code, but these languages gives you as a developer great degree of control. The great degree of control on how things exist in the memory, how they are located to the mem memory, and when they are freed. This is very subjective, but for me, the control of memory makes a difference between high-level and low-level languages. On the opposite side of the spectrum, there are languages like Python, Ruby, Lua, JavaScript, TypeScript, which frees you as a developer from having to worry about those low-level details. But then you lose the ability to reach down to those lower levels, should you need to. Until recently, JavaScript only had single numeric types, the floating point numbers. So if you needed to work with larger numbers, you couldn't do that. On the other hand, you wouldn't have to worry about where a list is stored in the memory. So you have this in between, between the advantage of high-level high programming and low-level programming. And then, of course, the language that sits in the middle, such as C-sharp, Java, Go, and Swift, they give you a great degree of control, but have mandatory garbage collector and reference control baked into language. And some of you might be thinking, what? So you don't have the degree of control that you could have from a language like C or C++ or Rust. But one of the best things about programming is that you have such a wonderful set of language. If you're doing high-level programming, you have Ruby, Python, JavaScript, TypeScript. And if you're doing low-level, you have C, C++, Rust. And for the in-between, you have C Sharp, Java, etc. And with all this language, you can see so many amazing software that we've built until you go to the web. When you go to the web, there's only one choice, and that choice is JavaScript. JavaScript is an excellent language, but it is a high-level language. That means there are strong opinion about what sort of data type there are and how you're going to use them. There's nothing wrong with JavaScript, but there is something wrong about having only one opinionated choice. If you bring a browser engine to a new platform, then you bring the whole, the whole web comes with it. And out of all apps that we have on the market, the web remains the killer app. If you look, if you look at it, on the smartwatch, you can access the web. On a, on a smart TV, you can access the web. On a fridge, if you have a smart fridge these days, you can access the web. And even in your car, if you have one of the fancy cars these days, uh, with all the perks, you can actually browse the web on your car. So the web is everywhere and it is a killer app. And nobody actually realized that the web is actually an application. It is an application. 
then next in the future, who knows where the web is going to go? But the problem, again, with the the problem is when you go to the web, there's only one high-level programming language that imposes a complexity flow, where you're not allowed to reach deeper into a machine than what JavaScript exposes. That means other language which target machine code have a harder time to go to the web. So that's where WebAssembly fits in. So we expect the web browsers to translate WebAssembly into machine code and execute it. So the idea here is that you can take a single file, a program, you compile it into WebAssembly, you get a WASM module, and then you distribute that WASM module to a number of platforms. So a program that you'll be writing in C, Rust, you compile it, you distribute it to, the, to a laptop running Chrome, you distribute the same WASM to a mobile phone running Safari or any, any browser of your choice, or you distribute it to an IoT device running uh, Node.js, for example, and all these, all these different platforms will be running different architectures, and they will be executing exactly the same code. So that's what WebAssembly is trying to address. If you go on a website, if you go on a website, can I use and you type WebAssembly, you'll find that you'll find that most of the web browsers these days are shipped with WebAssembly built in by default. This screenshot was done a couple of days ago, so that's where we are in two thousand in twenty twenty. So going back to where we were. Since 2017, we had web browsers shipping with WebAssembly. That means that the fourth thing, we have the fourth thing, and we had it for three years now. That So now we have content, presentation, high-level language, and thanks to WebAssembly, we can bring in low-level language to the web. Those two languages actually complement each other. Not that you'll have to be running WebAssembly only on the web. It actually gives you freedom. It gives you freedom to insert other tools of your choice. So the web stack is HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and anything else that compiles to WebAssembly. As a developer point of view, you should think about this. The web should not be monolingual. And it is not anymore, because we have WebAssembly, which gives us that platform which helps to bring other language to the web. So you must be asking, what is WebAssembly? Huh? Good question. WebAssembly is a way to run programming languages other than JavaScript in your web browser. In the past, as we have, as we have just seen, if you wanted to run code on a web page, you had to use JavaScript. If you wanted to change the DOM in response to an event or running calculation, you were using JavaScript. With WebAssembly, it will be possible to do these things with other language besides JavaScript. WebAssembly is also known as WASM. So what is WASM? WASM is an efficient and safe low-level bytecode for the web. So, how can WASM be efficient? Well, the goal of it is to be fast and to load, uh, it, sorry, the goal of it is to be fast, to load fast, and to execute fast. So fast to load meaning fast to send over the internet. Small binaries are critical. Compact form is critical. Fast to load also means fast to parse. And it also means fast to execute, fast to execute. Uh, in the past two years, there's uh, something great about WebAssembly, which uh, just uh, pop up, which is streaming compilation. This is actually fairly, uh, this is new, and what one of the uh, novel thing about it is, you can actually uh, you can actually send uh, while your WASM file is being downloaded, your web browser will be compiling it. What's going to be great about it is for the gaming engines. 
So you won't have you you won't have to wait for games to load. Like uh, gaming is just one example. You won't have to wait for the game to load fully to be able to start playing it. As it's being downloaded, it's the web browser will be able to compile it and it's gonna be running. So the idea is the bytes are coming in over the wire. The browser can actually compile those bytes to native machine code as they're being downloaded. We no more have to wait for the entire file to finish to download. So the, so the browser can parse and compile those bytes into machine code as they are being downloaded. From this animation that you can see in, on the screen, uh, we see that chunks of data are being downloaded and they're being, they are being compiled to machine code and are executed. So now the bottleneck is your internet connection. On the other hand, JavaScript <clears throat> is usually lazy, compiled lazily at runtime. Meaning you have to wait for JavaScript file to download first and then wait until they are parsed before you start compiling and executing them. With WebAssembly, there are less, to, less work to start with. Uh, decoding WebAssembly is much simpler and faster than parsing JavaScript. And this decoding and completion can be split across multiple threads. This means multiple threads will be doing baseline compilation, which make things run much faster. Once it's done, the baseline compile code can start executing on the main thread. It won't have to pose for compilation like JavaScript does. So we looked at how efficient was a maze. Now let's look at safety. What the web can do today versus what it could do uh, 10 years ago is dramatically different, right? Along the way, we've been very critical about security. Web browsers have been very cautious on security. WebAssembly is sandbox, just like JavaScript is. It's not arbitrary code running on your device. It can't make system call, and it can't directly access system files. In fact, running in your browser, it can interact the same way JavaScript does, which is by using APIs which are standardized and secure. WebAssembly itself is designed with security in mind. There is control flow integrity checks, stack protection, dynamic dispatch. That's a really low level thing. If you're not familiar with this, it's okay. But if you are, this uh, thing sh should be something that should get you hyped as a developer. In WebAssembly, there's no arbitrary executable memory block. The whole class of exploit cannot happen, even if you compile to C or C++, uh, if you compile C or C++ to WebAssembly. So if you think uh, I'll be able to run exploit uh, by writing some fancy C++ code, it's going to be a bit hard. Yes, you can overrun a buffer because the specification of C allows you to do that, but you can't really stuff that arbitrary code in there and expect it to run and do some malicious thing. So now that doesn't mean that every exploit is impossible on WebAssembly. Yes, we can, uh, there, there are, there's code reuse, there's side channel attacks, and there's also race condition. All things that WebAssembly that are still possible with WebAssembly. Um, okay, now let's look at, um, Low-level bytecode. This is not something that you'd be writing by hand. Low-level bytecode are just the binary. We're talking about the binaries. So let's be honest. Yes, you can write machine code by hand if you wish to, should you need to, but that's not everybody's cup of tea. WebAssembly is a portable binary instruction for. Sorry, WebAssembly is a portable binary instruction set for virtual machine. It's uh, like a CPU instruction set except for a virtualized machine. The goal being is that you don't have to care about what the CPU uh, is doing. If you're familiar with JVM, with Java bytecode, it's the, the idea is very similar to that. The idea is that you take some code like this, for example, this is C, C, uh, C++ code, you compile it to WebAssembly uh, bytecode, which is on the right, and, and you stream those bytecode to your browser. So WebAssembly is that efficient 
safe, low-level bytecode for the web. How do we get there? So there was a need for web, web assembly. So let's look at how, how, how we got there. When I mention WebAssembly for the first time, a lot of people bring this up. They say, is it Java? Is it this Java applet all over again? For those who have used Java applet uh, in the past, in theory, it is very similar. There are lots of reasons why Java applets never took off. It was basically, Java applet was basically a black box where you could just run some Java code and run there's some sort of binary arbitrary canvas thing into it. But you couldn't take advantage of the web APIs and it had, it had its own class of security exploits. Some of, you, some of you may say, that was Java applet, but what's more? There was more. We had ActiveX, we had Flash, we have Silverlight. And some of you may say, but what about JVM? Why not integrate JVM or CLO? Well, this one is really complex. The CLO and the JVM are both really, really great virtual machine for what they're intended to. And what they are intended for was not what WebAssembly is intended for. In my opinion, it comes down to most, well, in my opinion, it comes down to mostly misaligned goals. The goal of JVM and CLR is not the same as what WebAssembly is trying to address. Moreover, uh, because I mentioned CLR, some of you guys might be saying, oh yeah, .NET uh, came up with something. Yes, .NET came up uh, with Blazor, which is a fully featured and uh, which is fully featured and support WebAssembly uh, and is ready for production. So again, how we got there? What led to the conception of WebAssembly? Starting in um, 2011, and then again in 2015, uh, with some additional work, there's something called Portable Native Client, which was led by Google. There was a native client on NACL, as it's commonly known before that, and then there was the portable variant that came with it. The idea behind this was to take LLVM, the low-level virtual machine, if you're familiar with that, the uh, LLVM IR standardized a subset of the IR, the IR, which is the intermediate representation, and made that a target for the web. This was adopted by a lot of people within the Chrome ecosystem. And for those of you who use actually, who used Google Earth back then, you noticed that Google Earth was only supported in Chrome, but not on other browsers. That's because uh, uh, this, this project uh, was in the Chrome ecosystem. But other browsers, they saw that there was some gap and they saw something that they wanted to do different. So they decided not to adopt the standard. It, so it wasn't something proprietary to Google, but they were the only guys who were actually uh, using it. Next there is ASMJS. And this one, I think, got the most traction. It was spearheaded initially by Mozilla. And the idea behind that was take your C or C++, compile it down to a very strict subset of JavaScript, a subset of JavaScript that might look kind of quirky, but that actually was running on IE6 and IE7. So yeah, there's a lot of learning that happened when we were using the ASM. And I think ASMJS should be given the biggest credit for spearheading the initiative of WebAssembly. But there were a couple of fundamental problems with it. It was still JavaScript. It was still textual representation. It was not it was not binary encoding. So the file was very large and disappointing. And you couldn't add cool things like uh, SMID, a single instruction on multiple data, or multi-threading. ASMJS was primarily adopted by Mozilla, but, but Chrome and Edge also did some experiment in the browser engine as well, but the num never formally uh, supported ASM. So what happened next? Basically, we got Google and Mozilla having, having uh, some competing effort. And then they decided, they got around and decided to align themselves around the ASM. And they say, you know what? 
what would it take to do this thing right? What would it like to get both of their uh, research, I would say, together? And that's where WebAssembly came in. They say they got they, they got all of the companies like Apple, Microsoft together, and they started creating something brand new, something that we know is right from the start and ground up. So that's where WebAssembly came into existence. WebAssembly is really unprecedented. All of the browser vendors are getting together and creating not just uh, or cre uh, all of the browser vendors got together and created this uh, WebAssembly. All these companies, they created the first standardized bytecode. The good thing about WebAssembly is it is free. It is not proprietary. There's, there's no question about that. It is completely open. It is not incubated by any patent laws and all that kind of thing. There is actually the Bytecode Alliance, which is an open source community dedicated for creating secure software foundation, uh, building on standard, of uh, building the standard of uh, WebAssembly. So the Bytecode Alliance consists of a group of uh, it's a group of project organizations, as you can see, Mozilla, Fastly, Intel, Red Hat, uh, all these providing state of the art foundation for the development of runtime environment and the language tool chain where they address the security issue, efficiencies, and modularity, which can coexist uh, across a wide range of a wide range of device. This is an architecture for the web assembly. So let's have a quick look of a real world example of what we can make use of web assembly. Uh, in the very beginning, uh, when Firefox uh, uh, got WebAssembly built in their browsers, they demoed this uh, game, which is uh, Zen Garden. Um, that was making use of the. It was built in Zen Garden is actually a game uh, built in uh, C, if not uh, C plus plus, and. Uh, it made use of WebGL, and what we can see here is it was when it was ported in the browser that could make use of the Web WebGL on your on your machine via the web browser. Uh, another another great tool is uh, one password for those who love it. Uh, they moved to WebAssembly uh, because they saw a forty x speed increase. How they how they uh, found found uh, this uh, increase in speed is uh, one password uh, do a lot of page filling analysis and uh, they look for they look for fields uh, on um, website to to know where to put the password and um, it came down that when they were, when they did a test of the same code that was uh, first firstly written in JavaScript and then in a, a in uh, C, I think C++, and then ported to Wasm, they found out that the increase was drastic. It was 40 times faster. Uh, another great tool is AutoCAD. Uh, AutoCAD uh, uses EM scripting to put pieces of a legacy code, which is over 35 years old uh, code, to the web. Uh, I think uh, if, you, if you just think about it, that, that is pretty awesome. Something that was written 35 years ago and still being used these days, and that also on the web, I would say, wow. Um, and, the, and AutoCAD is computationally intensive, so I'm amazed. Uh, I mentioned before, uh, Blazor uses WebAssembly to allow, the, to allow running .NET on the web. Uh, this shows another feature of WebAssembly, which is uh, portability allowing code of different languages to be run in more places. So all the DOM interaction is done with glued code using JavaScript. So yes, there's still some JavaScript uh, running behind the scene. eBay, eBay, they use WebAssembly to bring their barcode scanning features found in the native Android and uh, iOS app to the mobile web app. 
So one of the beauties when you when you're writing uh, native code on Android and uh, iOS, you're actually harnessing the power of the hardware. But if you load the same page on the mobile web, then you can't really access the you can't really harness the power of the hardware. But what uh, eBay did is when they implemented this feature uh, in JavaScript, it was slow, and then um, they took the same code. Uh, which was again written in uh, which was a C++ library. Uh, they use EM scripting, EM scripting, and they saw a drastic uh, increase in uh, speed. For those who remember Doom Three, that's a game that was very famous ages ago. So here we can see the D3 Wasm. Uh, they use the e they use again uh, EM scripting to port the game. This is quite notable, as it proved that WebAssembly can bring these uh, large C, C++ code base to the web. And it's impressive that we're actually getting 3D games on the web. This one is uh, Figma. Uh, I think those of you who like to design and do wireframe, uh, they must have come across Figma. Figma also uses WebAssembly. Uh, that uh, the library that Figma uses was originally written in C++, and then it was exported to Asm.js using uh, EM scripting. Uh, however, uh, initially they were using uh, ASM.js, and then um, when WebAssembly was uh, launched, they moved to WebAssembly, and they saw that uh, compared to what the, 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 the speed they had on ASM.js, to uh, WebAssembly, there was a three times increase in speed. So again, we see that uh, WebAssembly is faster than what we had previously. MongoDB, MongoDB Compass has logic for sample field analysis. Originally, that was written in uh, JavaScript, but due to the limitation of JavaScript, they could only parse a thousand documents uh, fast enough before it was going too slow. Then the team proceeded to rewrite their sample field analysis tool in Rust and ported it to Wasm. And what they saw was, a, again, another 40x uh, speed increase. So uh, initially, it took two minutes to process um, a document. And the same document, uh, after being ported to WebAssembly, took three seconds. So two minutes, three seconds, that is fast. So Wasm, we can say, is great for computational is great for computationally intensive tasks. Uh, Google Earth, Google Earth. These days, you can use Google Earth on, I think, almost all all, all browsers. Google Earth used EM scripting to port pieces from the all native application of Google Earth. Uh, for those who remember that, it, it started as an application that you download, and then uh, slowly it moved to the web. The Chrome only had it. Now all browsers support it. Uh, this also is quite notable as it's proved that WebAssembly can bring this large C, C++ code base using EM scripting to the web. And uh, also it makes use of the impressive 3D graphics. SketchUp, another tool that uh, people use for 3D modeling and designing, that also make, made use of um, uh, WebAssembly. Bearing in mind that SketchUp is uh, has some heavy processing and is CPU intensive. So TensorFlow.js. TensorFlow.js is an open um, source hardware. Yeah, it is used for artificial intelligence, obviously. Uh, it is used for um, uh, computing neural network. So what TensorFlow.js saw was a 10x uh, speed increase uh, on their prediction engine when they started using WebAssembly compared to the uh, old ver variant they, they had. So TensorFlow started as obviously TensorFlow.js, but now it's moved to WebAssembly and it's way faster uh, in computing. Uh, one of the cool things these days with uh, mobile phone is uh, augmented reality, uh, so web AR. Uh, eight wall have been, have been enabled enabling developers to create, collaborate, and publish web uh, AR experiences that run directly on a mobile device. So 
what they've been doing is they've been leveraging Unity WebAssembly. So Unity is a great tool for building, obviously, game and web uh, and uh, augmented reality. So they've been uh, using the, that to build some uh, WebAssembly games. Well, you can you can actually test it if you go on the eighth wall and you can run the demo and you'll find it. Uh, it's pretty amazing. Uh, and also we've got uh, least. The last but not least, we've got blockchain also. So Ethereum Iwasm is a proposed redesign of the Ethereum smart contract execution layer using a deterministic subset of WebAssembly. Uh, so what is Iwasm? Iwasm is based on WebAssembly. It is, it is a restricted subset of Wasm, which is used for contracts in Ethereum. So it specifies the VM semantics. Ah, it's a bit hard to explain here, but... Um, but let's just say that uh, Ethereum Wasm aims aims to uh, aim to bring blockchain uh, using WebAssembly. So uh, what we can see, we can see that there's loads of uh, technologies, loads of uh, benefits that we have with Wasm. We've got speed. We can bring legacy code on there. We can. We saw that Microsoft brought the, that .NET platform on now to WebAssembly. We got AI, we got blockchain, we got AI, all these, all these. So WebAssembly is enable, uh, enabling us to use all these technologies on the web. So one of the good thing is I can't actually demo it here for legal purposes, but if you Google about it, you can actually run Windows 95 on your browser. So just type Windows 95 in your browser and it will bring it up to it to a link and if you wait long enough, it will download the whole Windows 95 on your browser and it will run it and you can have a play with it for those who are a bit nostalgic about it. So uh, how do we get started with Wasm? Some of you might ask. There is this uh, EM scriptum that I've been mentioning quite a lot. Um, it's a tool chain that enables you to port your C and C++ to the web. Uh, for those who say, oh, I'm not in the C or C++ world, what can I use? What else can I use? There's Rust. Uh, you can actually use Rust and it will allow you to supercharge your JavaScript. And also there is, for those who are familiar with uh, TypeScript, there's AssemblyScript, which is very similar to TypeScript. That also allows you to write uh, WebAssembly code. Uh, well, not WebAssembly code, sorry. That allows you to write code and then you put it into WebAssembly. So let's do a quick demo. Uh, I'm going to write something in C. I'm going to compile it to WebAssembly and then I'm going to uh, call that uh, file into project and use some JavaScript glue. And let's have a look. So, uh, there is this awesome website, which is uh, copy pasting always help. So, uh, if we go on this, uh, we type in a simple C++ instruction or hit compile. We'll find that it's going to create a the wasm assembly and then that's the targeted file click on uh, download uh we've got test.wasm so i'm gonna save this file and this file saved now we've got this file here i'm gonna copy this i'll take it i'll put it in this file and here i'll paste it here and I'll rename it to whoop. I'll just rename it to demo. And then I'm gonna open this with Visual Studio Code and we can see that's the demo wasm here. Obviously it's a binary file, we can't see it. Uh, so 
what, was, what we're going to do here, here we have, uh, and uh, we're going to be calling this uh, JavaScript. Uh, JavaScript isn't, uh, yes, we still need JavaScript to read the WASM file in the future. In the future, hopefully, we'll be able to uh, import it straight away, but we're still getting there. So in our JavaScript file, we're just uh, loading this web assembly. We're just loading the web assembly, and we're specifying which uh, function we are calling. Uh, if, let me just show you that. That's the that's the name of the function here, and that's what we'll be calling uh, here. Uh, let's try it. So, but uh, back to this. What we try, what we wrote here is a square function. So if we pass it a number, it should return the square of that number, and we go live. Okay, we bring up the console. Hopefully, if everything is running, if I type square and I type in 10, I should be getting 100. Woohoo! That works. So now, what you guys must realize is, or must think uh, about is this function was written in, we just wrote this function in. Uh, C++, we just wrote this function in C++, we compiled it, we compiled it to WebAssembly and we used some JavaScript glue uh, to bring it up to the web and here we, we're calling it. So that's really how all the other um, software out there are porting their legacy or I would say uh, C++ C, uh, libraries to the web. And that's how they're making use of what uh, uh, the limitation. They're, they're actually addressing what the limitation of JavaScript is. That's what they're addressing with, uh, with WebAssembly. So that's the end uh, for me. Uh, thank you very much. If you've got any question, feel free to ask. I'll be more than happy to answer it. All right. Hey, Rishi. We are back no. live. <laughs> so that was awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, speaking of questions, actually, uh, we do have quite a few um, wow. <laughs> from Rengen. So um, let's go through it. Um, I think you covered a few of them uh, during the presentation, but let's still go through it. Um, WebAssembly. So is WebAssembly subject to the usual problems of low-level programming, things like buffer overflow, um, stack overflow, and so on? Is it still subject to that uh, or, or not? Yes. Yes, I did. I did mention that. I did mention that um, uh, they're still subjected to that because if you look at C, C allows you to overrun a buffer, so that's in the specification of C. It's not something that WebAssembly will stop you from doing because you're writing your code in C. So if you can over write a, over overrun a buffer there, yes, it will. It will overrun. What um, what WebAssembly is is actually unable you to bring that code that you wrote that you wrote in C to the web so if you made some bug there or if you're trying to do some funny stuff which you shouldn't be doing yes that will allow you to do it uh, obviously there are some there, there is the bike alliance which ensure that uh, there are some guidelines that you need to follow and uh, there are some api calls that you need to make on the web browser to actually prevent you from running my just exploit but the security layer is there it's still getting uh, uh, stricter and stricter, but yes, you can do whatever you feel like with uh, your yeah. native code. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, actually, also from Rangan, this is this is kind of um, for a few different technologies. I, I'll compile it into a single question. Um, so, with WebAssembly, it brings forth um, normally you can work uh, using OpenGL, so you can do OpenGL development. Um, it kind of has the potential in a way to make um, component intensive frameworks like Angular um, redundant. And it might even lead to Node.js being, um, you know, their importance, their adoption rates going low. So basically, if I have to summarize this question, the um, these questions, the technologies that WebAssembly is, is um, diving into, it has, other counterparts right now. So, what could happen to them, in your opinion? 
things uh, like WebGL, um, Angular, and NPM, for example? Well, that's the thing about uh, technology. Uh, every every ten years, you think uh, you see a, v a new vague of new technologies taking over, and some of them sadly uh, dying off. Uh, but what I, what I want to stress is WebAssembly is not. I think you mentioned Angular or React. WebAssembly, the purpose is not to replace uh, to yeah. replace this. The purpose yeah. is to work along with it. So if you have an awesome Angular app or an awesome uh, React app, but you got that one uh, library that you written like ages ago in uh, another language, like I would say Rust or C, for example, if you got like a very old language, but you don't want to, for some reason, you don't want to like uh, rewrite the whole thing because that's been working and you know it's worked great. So you can use uh, EM Scriptum to port that library, only that library, yeah. bring it up to your web, and then you use your Angular, your Vue, your React app to make call to it as you I've just, as I've just demoed making a simple mm -hmm. call to a function. You make call to it and you start using it. So that uh, that actually um, make make allow you to use what you've written before. It's not here to replace what's existing. It's here to make them work together. So the aim is to use what we have now and what we had in the past together. Obviously, in the future, maybe it will evolve at some point. Technology do phase out, but yeah, mm -hmm. the aim is to work together, not to replace. I share that opinion with you, actually. I think that, um, for example, React or Angular, um, what would happen, kind of what we, we, we see with Blazor, with C Sharp, um, ASP, .NET, they had their own thing going on, but then they came up with Blazor to um, cater for WebAssembly as well. So I think um, it's not really about replacing, as you mentioned, it's more about um, both WebAssembly and the existing technologies um, adapting to each other. So that um, maybe Angular or, or React, uh, maybe they'll try something to make it so that you can work with WebAssembly um, in tandem with what they offer. I don't think they are just going to phase out like that. They are still big players, but I think exactly. they will adapt. Yeah, exactly. So Web, WebAssembly is just giving us uh, it's giving us an opportunity to bring in more tools to the web. Right now, we only have. I mean, um, maybe it's opinionated topic, but right now we only have JavaScript. Yes, we have TypeScript, but that compiles mm -hmm. and transpiles down to JavaScript. But right now, the main thing is JavaScript, JavaScript, JavaScript. But what about other languages, other, other beautiful languages that we have? So yeah. with WebAssembly, we have that opportunity to bring in those uh, languages. So yeah, that was, that was a really interesting session, uh, Rishi. I have one question. It's not related wow. to WebAssembly at all. Have you ever played Worms? Worms Armageddon. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that, that I, I'm gonna... was back in the days, man. That was back I, in the days. Yeah. Okay. Then, <laughs> then I love the session. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you for being here, Rishi. It was a great session. Um, really interesting and informative. Um, guys, feel free to get in touch with Rishi. He left his Twitter uh, handle. Um, and I guess we bid you goodbye for now. To the Thank next you very one. much. Goodbye. Thank you guys. Bye bye. Bye. bye.